This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome the show Rob Goodridge and Jason Armstrong. How are you guys doing? Good, great, brother. thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so yeah. much for for coming on the show, guys. You guys are are you guys are as they say in fuego right now, uh, doing a lot of uh, a lot of productions, and uh, I want and you have a very kind of like a different way of doing what you guys are doing, which I really want to kind of get into. But before we get started, man, how did you both get started in this insane business? <laughs> Rob, you well, you know what? I'll, I'll lean over to Jay. He's my senior, so I'll let him go first. <laughs> oh, very nice. I'm sure, yeah. and I'm sure he reminds you about that all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. <laughs> or vice versa. Exactly. So, uh, so yeah, no. Um, started off in the business uh, originally as a uh, copywriter in uh, in commercials and everything, and then uh, handling a commercial down in L.A. Met a producer, asked me if I was interested in uh, writing for television. So, uh, so then uh, developed a, a children's, well, sort of a tween series. Uh, at that time, he had an output deal with Nickelodeon. So it was originally something for Nickelodeon, and then Disney came in and and uh, sort of swept swept uh, swept it away, took it and worked uh, worked on that, um, and then created another series. Um, I would say probably about a year after that, and uh, and then you sort of fall into that writer's room of, you know, sort of the in-house writers and, and everything else. But uh, that was sort of the, the early, you know, the early stage into the business was, was very much from a writing perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in that tween world and then started slowly moving into producing, you know, my own content, uh, having a little bit, uh, a little bit more control, obviously, right. Or over, over the creative um, to an extent, to an extent at that mm-hmm. stage. And then, uh, yeah, and then did a lot of uh, children's series, produced a lot of children's series, um, a lot of co-pro deals. At that time, I was in Canada, so I was doing a lot of co-pro deals between Canada and the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just kept uh, kept rolling into uh, to different things. There was some obviously some lifestyle stuff that came into play, and, sure. then, uh, and then and then dove into uh, into the features. And how about you, Rob? Well, you know, it's funny. I never, uh, I never considered myself much of a film guy growing up. I always enjoyed going to the movies. I enjoyed renting movies. Um, but you know, as far as telling you who was in every movie, who directed it, just never really was my forte. I, I never took a huge interest. What I did find was that I had a really good rapport uh, with people, and I had a good, good ability to to sort of put pieces together. Um, I found that through playing sports as a kid and, you know, always sort of being in a leadership position. So I, I, I guess through college, which had no film intentions, uh, I started to develop more and more of, a, of an interest in entertainment. Uh, I ended up working on the music side first, to be honest with you. I was working with a lot of artists helping to coordinate um, sort of like those uh, radio concerts that they would do mm-hmm. uh, seasonally. So what that really did was that taught me how to work with artists and work with sort of the in and out demands of not just a rapper or a band or this or that, but their entire entourage. And so it was sort of a culmination of taking my ability uh, to sort of put puzzle pieces together and my growing fascination with film. So through that sort of music thing and, and introductions to a lot of managers and sort of that that circle of that high level music world i uh i took an interest in film and i i did what we all sort of hope hope we all do is i pa i pa'd on a abc <laughs> reality show which i will not name realized that that was not for me uh and then i got a call from paramount that said hey you know you 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 worked with justin bieber on the music side would you have any interest in coming and sort of uh consulting as a producer with us on the never uh say never bieber tour uh which paramount did so i had worked with some of the other producers on that prior uh and that really sort of kicked it off i mean i think it's I, i don't know if i had a career path set in mind uh i've always looked at producing in sort of a broad scope you know I, I think 
entertain entertainment is entertainment and what is entertaining to somebody is different to another right. so i i've always taken my background in music transitioned it into film uh and a little bit of tv as all sort of just being the same thing you know it's all just sort of management from top to bottom so uh through that ironically enough years later uh, that's how jay and i met was okay under the roof at BMG Music <laughs> through through a colleague um, who said, I think you guys would really mesh well. Um, and so we had both sort of taken our own paths in the film world and, and had some success with that and certainly climbed our way up and, mm-hmm. and touched every corner of the business and had some success and had some failure and got our bruises. But uh, by the time Jay and I met at BMG Music, uh, it was actually to discuss a film and immediately hit it off and, and and i think it was that perfect moment where we collided and, and could really complement one another with where we were at in our own careers and where we were you know aiming to go you know it's so funny because you know, i've been in the business now for 20 odd years and uh you know when you're when you're working with somebody especially a, a producing partner it's like dating like you're getting into a marriage you are you know oh, yeah. there's no question about it, especially when you're like on one project, it's like that, let alone multiple projects over the course of years. So I, that's something a lot of filmmakers don't really understand about the partnership scenario. It's you're dating before you get married. And Absolutely. and you're you're married after you, you signed the deal to make the first film. And then you're like, all right, we, we dated already. Right. You know, and we could divorce after this project, but we're going to go through this project. Together. <laughs> oh, are you kidding? As soon as you create an LLC, you're Done. pretty much common law. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> no question. Yeah. It is, and and there is. So, you guys seem to like you know from what I was able to gather uh, through your IMDb profiles, you guys have been hustling for a while uh, in your own worlds. But it seems like when you guys got together, in more recently actually, you just started all of a sudden. Like you were in a lot of productions and a lot of different things going on at the same time. So that's very unusual for a new, you know, producing partnership uh, that I've seen. I don't see, like, it just doesn't overnight just come up. You guys have both been working out. You've, you've done some work in the feature world. You've done some work in television world, but really not like what you're doing now. Not at the level you're doing it now with the cast and things like that. What kind of, what started this explosion of of these, you know, doing so many projects and with the caliber of people you're doing uh, so recently? You know what? It was sort of a collection of years where we very mindfully said, you know, let's let's get that IP. Let's get the content. Let's make sure that that our catalog is full of stuff where we know we can pull something out. And when we've got that extra piece, we can really start to package it more seriously. And, you know, look, I mean, we've, we've been fortunate with the snowball effect. Um, we've identified IP that we that we think fits into the market well. Uh, but we've also identified a time that unfortunately has been so damaging for so many businesses. We've, you know, we've used a formula in the past two years where we've been able to create, you know, marketable films for modest budgets. And, and really when the world has been so scared about, you know, big crowds and heavy footprints, we've been able to go shoot these movies you know, not on a Netflix budget <laughs> where they're not concerned about insurance, but really more on a smaller budget with smaller crews where we can say to actors, look, we need you for six days or we need you for three days. Uh, we've limited our shooting schedules and, you know, this, the scope of our films are sort of in that mid range, but, you know, we've shot six this year as a result. And I think that snowball effect when you can go to an agency and actually deliver a fee on time in escrow and you can get an actor to come and have a pleasant experience, uh, it really has a positive effect. And I mean, we're fortunate now where we've got a lot of agents calling and saying, Hey, what do you have that I can sneak a, an actor in? Or would you look at, would you look at this project? Uh, so, so we we really were aware of not trying to jump the gun mm-hmm. uh, and just make a movie to make a movie but really be a little bit more strategic in in how we rolled it out. Yeah. And also I would say, I'm just sort of uh, add on to that. Um, You know, through that time, a story can be achieved in just the same way and have it be self-contained. You know, Mm -hmm. you can still have great stories 
that doesn't that don't have to have an incredible number of company moves and have all of these different settings. There there was, you know, through COVID, there was this opportunity to still have, you know, tell great stories and focus very heavily on the character development through the story. And that could be achieved, you know, with fewer cast members, uh, fewer locations, um, and still, you know, still deliver great content. That that did speak to the market. So, you know, it, it was it was just that opportunity. And, to, and also to touch on uh, the other thing that you mentioned, Alex, with regards to sort of moving quickly. Um, I feel as though there's, you know, everyone sort of, if they've been involved in the business from every angle over a long period of time. So, I mean, like Rob and I, like before we were mentioning about PA, you know, worked as, I mean, I've been a scripty, you know, I've been a continuity <laughs> director. I mean, I've been a Jenny op. I mean, so like <laughs> carry through all these things. And what happens with all that is you have, you start to develop this very, very large network. And when you find someone to partner with that isn't so safeguarded and protects that network, because I, I feel a lot in our industry, you know, even if people partner together on one film, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, these are my guys. Or these are this is my network. This is who I access. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that just puts up these walls immediately that shouldn't be there because this is a collaborative business. I mean, that's right. that's where you thrive. And I feel as though Rob and I, when we partnered, our success sort of happened very quickly because there were none of those walls. It was each of our networks became one large network, and we were able to sort of pinpoint where certain strengths on certain projects could stand. And, and access those um, without delay. And I think that's sort of, you know, that's, that's, what you, that's what you need to do if you're going, if you are going to partner together and build a slate and evaluate IP and determine whether the market speaks to that, you know, that content and everything, you need to be able to be an open book with right. regards to what your access is. Um, <laughs> It's interesting because if I go go back to the analogy of the marriage, when you start dating someone or you even start moving in with somebody, uh, you don't have a joint account just yet. You have separate you have separate accounts, and then look when you have a joint account, it's serious. Now we're sharing our money, so it's the same thing. You're sharing your contacts, you're sharing your network, and by doing that, you're able to basically put gasoline on the fire because yeah. you're able to access so many things. Yeah. I've been with, I've, you know, I've, 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 I've partnered with people. They're like, yeah, I, I hang out with Tom Cruise every weekend. I'm like, can, can, can you, can you talk to, <laughs> can you talk to Tom Cruise? No, no, I can't. That's very sensitive. I can't talk to Tom Cruise. I'm like, yeah, what the hell are we doing here? I'm using that as an yeah. example. I don't know anybody who knows Tom Cruise. But anyway, but you know what I'm saying? But, but, but I get the point. You get the point. Like, and it, and it could be something as like, oh yeah, me and Thomas Jane go hang out. And we go golfing. Uh, oh, can we maybe pitch him this project? You're like, ah, well, that's uh, it's my that's my connection with Thomas. That's not with you know. It's weird, right. but it, but it's it's kind of this whole energy that a lot of people in the industry have of of lack of 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 fear because you you know I think you both can agree this entire business is run on fear. Hollywood is okay. run is completely run on fear, on FOMO, fear of missing out. Huge deals have been dropped. Huge amount of money have been dropped. Purely on the fear of losing out, uh, and, and if and we and we unfortunately have seen some of those movies <laughs> over the right. years. But um, but Rob, you were talking about your formula. Can you kind of dive into this this formula that you that you guys are working on that are able to do all this in today's environment? Because I think you probably started prior to COVID, but you were kind of like primed, ready for it when it came out in, in a way. Yeah, we really were. Um, you know, it's interesting. Look, at the end of the day, it, it, for any filmmaker, it's always about money. And, <laughs> and, and not necessarily, hey, how am I going to make money? But how are we going to source money? Right. Uh, and I think that's where that's where I think we really separate ourselves. We, you know, we're, we're genre agnostic. And by what I mean by that is we, we don't marry ourselves to a horror film or a drama or this. I mean, we're looking at the market. We're filmmakers, but we're also businessmen. Mm -hmm. And we want to be able to say, all right, if I want to do this one day, I have to have the track record of doing X, Y, Z before that to be taken right. seriously. Right. And so we're really in the business of establishing partnerships, creating, you know, good relationships with people. I know that sounds sort of cliche. So a big part of our formula is, you know, who do we like to work with? Because who can we call next to say, all right, guys, you know, I'm in I'm in Las Cruces, New Mexico right now. So, okay, guys, 
here's the tax credit here. Here's where we know where certain soft money sits. Can we go to the usual partners? So we start to analyze a project based on certainly location and what those tax credits look like. So we can get some semblance of where, where our financing structure comes into play. As that's happening, we're in daily communication with our sales partners, our distribution partners, really working backwards so that we can say, all right, this finance plan actually does fit in line with the scale of the film, the budget. We can make this type of movie with this amount of crew, for instance. We're a union uh, production company. We're always hiring union crews. So by working backwards, obviously, like a lot of filmmakers, we're in daily communication with those distributors or those sales companies saying, okay, what do we think about this cast list? What do we think about this? So that everything that we're doing, we're checking a box so that we don't have that, pardon my French, that oh shit moment, you know, when we're in post and go, oh, I, if I just did this differently, if I just had that actor or I just thought about that <laughs> other scene differently. So we really, we try to work backwards to a degree. Uh, one of the things, you know, that I, I think has been working for us is, you know, we've built some good relationships with talent. We've, we've got actors that enjoy working on our sets. We try to keep it relaxed and, you know, we welcome the creative feedback and collaboration. So when we're able to call an agent or an actor and say, Hey, we've got this project where they're calling us and saying, I'm looking for something for two weeks. What do you have? Well, that's such a big piece of the puzzle mm -hmm. that we're then able to really get that packaging process going a lot faster. You know, we're, we're not necessarily always hunting to make a movie, bring it to a festival, get all the awards, do everything. I mean, it's a different climate today, as we all know. I mean, we're very interested in exploring and evaluating every project and every sales opportunity every day that we're prepping, filming, and in post so that we're always elevating the value of a project. We're looking at streamer deals, we're looking, we, we, we look at theatrical, but we're always exploring what that best fit is for any film. And we've been very fortunate. I mean, New Mexico has been terrific. Massachusetts has been terrific. Toronto has been good to us. So um, I, I hope that answers part of it. I, I, I sort of went around and around. So, you're, so what you guys are basically saying is don't shoot a $2 million period piece personal film with no stars attached shot in black and white is generally <laughs> is generally not what you want right. to do and that's the approach of so many filmmakers they just like i want to make art i'm like great if you want to make art make it for five dollars don't make it for five right. million and and mortgage your house which i've had people on the show who've mortgaged their house have lost their right. house right. because they're like hey i think this is gonna go it's the craziest it, it, our business is so insane because I've talked to investors and they're like, you guys, this is insanity. I'm like, it is. Yeah. But yeah. if you know what you're doing, it can be – you can make money with it. But <laughs> the scope of – of um, you could spend $2 million and have n a, literally a useless product. You yeah, could spend $2 million like on cookies. You have $2 million worth of cookies you could sell. <laughs> <laughs> can eat. Right. So there's a, pro there's a product there. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and we're not afraid either. And I think it's important to be honest in this business. I don't think you have to be a jerk, but I think it's good to be transparent. And look, I mean, we know how to finance films. We know how to package talent. We know how to sell films. So we can we can analyze a project from really any perspective, not to say we're the best at it, but, you know, we've got a pretty good understanding of each so that when we're talking to a filmmaker or we're talking or evaluating a new project, we can very easily, to your point, say, look at it. totally love where you're coming from but here's why that wouldn't work <laughs> right in today's instead world instead of right. saying instead of saying you know your project sucks we're not going to do it maybe there's some value in it so then we can have a more collaborative conversation and say look this is how we might approach it these are the types of people we might bring into it to help you see you know this follow through with your intentions we never want to say no to any project off the bat but we are pretty quick to say here are the things that we know won't work and that's based on real-time experience, real-time market trends, real-time investors, et cetera. Now, well, I mean, the other thing, the other thing uh, I would want to say too is, I mean, 
a lot of art is a time and chance, right? I mean, it really does play by time and chance, especially within the arts. So there are things that are going to speak to certain times. There, you know, there's going to be an audience for certain content at a certain time. And unfortunately, you know, something can get lost if it, uh, if it isn't, you know, released or, or evaluated at the right time. So, I mean, that's the other thing that we'll pay very close attention to is, uh, is recognizing, you know, what right now, this would be, unfortunately, the, it's not so much even how it's being built out so far. It's just that it will not achieve the audience that it should right now. So in order to, and then that, and then that becomes just this lost art. And to your point before, it is a business. So if it's, if you are going to do it as a hobby in the arts, then that is one thing. If it is going to operate as a business, then yes, you need, you need to develop something that people want and that will sell. Right. And, and that doesn't, and the, and there's a lot of fear that surrounds that, that people, when they hear that, they start to think, oh, how is that going to jeopardize the creative? How is that going to alter this, 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 and this, and this? And it doesn't actually have to do that. And, and at the same time, let's, let's look at that. If it's something that is not flexible, that cannot be flexible, um, cannot be examined, you know, in, in order to sort of build it in a different, in a different way, then it might be, it's something that just sits somewhere and is never seen, never heard of, no one's ever aware of, which is fine. But one of the, one of the most valuable things in the art world is literally in, you know, having an effect on people, uh, right. you know, provoking a conversation. Uh, excitement, anything like that. That's 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 sort of the the largest payoff outside of the ROI that you know investors obviously want. But the largest payoff is actually having that developing an audience, having an effect on its audience. Right. So that's you know that's something you really you know you do have to pay attention to the timing of these things. And if something's not now, it can be a year from now. It can you know in or find a way for it to be that. So right. So in other words, Contagion not going to come out right now. As a brand new movie, <laughs> not really like if it, I don't care if it's Steven Soderbergh, not happening right now. Nobody <laughs> not, wants not to see that. Man. How many, how many, how many pandemic movies have you turned down in the last two years? <laughs> oh, it's wild. Well, it, right? Am I right? It's, how quickly, it's wild. It's, it's, it's funny how quickly people pick up on a trend and go, here, I've got this. What do you think? I, I've been yelling on my show for the last two years. Nobody wants your pandemic script. Nobody wants to watch it. Nobody wants to see it. I don't care if Meryl Streep's in it. Nobody wants to watch that because we're living it. It's kind of like having a terrorist movie a week after 9-11. So uh, one of the things, uh, is there something that you see in your in your day-to-day, -day, some mistakes that you see filmmakers make when they're pitching to producers uh, or trying to pitch you guys a script or or a project or something like that because there is a you know I do my best with this show to educate as many filmmakers as humanly possible about the realities of this business and the realities of like don't run up to you at a Starbucks and go here's my script read it I don't know who you are you don't know who I am I mean you don't know who I am but here read it there are certain ways of doing things is there mistakes that you consistently see that you can kind of call out and hopefully help some people listening well. Uh, Jay, I can jump in first. I mean, I think I think a common thing that sort of gets under my skin a bit, just because it never works, um, and I never, you know, look, we've all pitched something before, right? So I, I don't ever um, shame anybody for doing that. You know, when you come up and you say, oh, I've got money attached, I've got these <laughs> investors or this actor, I want to call BS every time. I mean, one of the ways that Jay and I typically vet a project in about five seconds is I say, tell me where your bank account is and I'll make a $1 deposit. Because if they've got a bank account open, well, then they're more of a business to me. But it, how do you have these investors and how do you have this infrastructure set up to make a movie that we can just jump in and start packaging <laughs> if it's not really set up? And then it's the phantom investor or it's the phantom actor who, to your point earlier, is like the cousin of Tom Cruise that went out once. But ooh, I don't want to call him yet because he's, you know, in Uruguay. So that's a big red flag. You know, right. when I, I would much rather see a project when somebody says, hey, I love this movie that you guys just did. I think I have something that might connect with you, might not. Let me just send you a log line. Or would it be okay if I just sent you some preliminary info without all the baggage? 
you know, then it could be more appealing to sort of say, oh, you know what, this is pretty cool. Let us follow up. Let us see where it's at. Because we have the tools to help package that if it's something that we like. It, it's just sort of the... the so, the so, letter, so the letters of intent, not so much. Yeah, a letter <laughs> of intent is... Uh, Let's check out those signatures. It's nice, it's nice to have, I guess. But, no, yeah, no you, be honest. Be, be honest. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely almost useless. It's it, like, it's literally, yeah. it's absolutely almost useless letters of intent. I re- oh God, I was up, I was packaging a deal uh, and the producer was like, oh, we have this letter of intent from this Oscar winner. And, the, and I saw it and everywhere he, I mean, literally if he could have tattooed it on his freaking chest, he would have tattooed because everywhere he walked in, he's like, yeah. here's my letter of intent with this yeah. dude that I spoke that to and convinced. The first talking point. Yeah, the first talking point is like, I have a letter of intent from this Oscar winner. Here's his signature. So all that says to me is that you were able to calm this poor <laughs> older actor. You were with a letter of commitment? No, no. The, the yeah. Letter of what? No, no. That's a letter yeah. of intent, <laughs> letter sir. Letter of intent and then he had a letter of commitment. There's so a, like a letter of intent from the talent, a letter of commitment from the financing. No, commitment? Stop <laughs> it. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? Here's, here's, the, here's the behind the curtain of all of that, right? I mean, yeah. we obviously work with a number of the agencies and, and sure. projects from them. And they'll have talent, quote unquote, attached that aren't, quote unquote, attached. So it's hard enough for the people that are in the industry, the <laughs> right. managers, the producers, the talent, yeah. to actually have a project that is that far along. So when you've got somebody that is fairly new to the game or trying to break in or has a great idea, it's just that much more unbelievable to no fault of their own. But it's just such an uphill battle. I mean, really, where we are in an industry right now and where we've had some success, not to give the company sauce away, but look, you make an offer, you make a pay or play offer and you deliver the funds and that's going to make it real to an agent. And it's yep. amazing how quickly that reverberates through the industry. Oh, wow. They, they actually escrowed that talent a day before it was due or the day oh. it was due. Oh yeah. And they signed the contract. So that's what makes it real. No one is attached until that money is in that account. And for better or worse, where we are, I mean, it's such a competitive market right now. There's so much out there and there's so many places to put content that you've got to make it real by putting the money in the account and you got to be willing to part ways with it. And with that comes a lot of risk for producers, but you know, you got to be confident in what you're doing. You got to You have to be confident in the model that you've put together, right? Because there's always been a filtering system that's existed, right? We know that. And it's because otherwise there'd just be so much being channeling into all of these outlets. And now there's just so many. So the filtering system has just become even more uh, prominent and important. And so a way to actually get around that is to have everything built. So if you are going to engage, you have the money to engage. It's not, it's not, oh, we're engaging. And then there's going to be this long period of time where nobody's talking about it because you couldn't really have the follow through. That's, you know, immediately that's a red flag and people aren't going to take you seriously. So the second that you do engage with the people that you do need to put your project together, everything has to be in place so that if you get a yes, you act on it immediately. And that is, uh, that's refreshing because that doesn't happen in our business at all. Uh, it's a lot of talk. It's a lot of talk, a lot of like, you know, lip service and all this kind of stuff. And I mean, God, how many people are like, oh, I have this guy attached or I've got this money's about to drop. Oh, I love that term. The yeah. money's about to drop. Tomorrow it's dropping. Oh, we got pushed back. Oh, because his allowance hasn't hit yet because, yeah. you know, he's a multimillionaire yeah. in England and uh, his wife gives him a million dollars every month as a, and, and he just wants to be in the movie. And we've, I'm sure I'm not telling you stories you've not heard. It's a small, it's a small little role, like maybe at the bar or something, you know, give him two lines and he'll finance the whole movie. Like we hear all these stories. And by the way, everyone who's not watching this, we're all laughing. We're all, we're all, we have smiles on our faces because we all heard these stories before, but it's so fascinating over my career. It doesn't change. No. What those stories that we're just talking about happened to me in the nineties when I was coming up. And they're still happening today and they think that they work. And that's why I kind of call out, you know, letters of intent and like oh, but yeah. what, all this kind of stuff that's all kind of fluff, you know, or I could get this guy on the phone or I once walked by this person or, you know, I, I park cars or where this guy plays golf or something. 
there's always so many of these stories, but what you guys are doing is interesting because you're actually, I don't know, doing what you say you're going to do, <laughs> which is yeah. oddly a rarity in this business. <laughs> oddly. <laughs> uh, how I've always found it fascinating how anything ever gets done in, in Hollywood. And I can't even comprehend at the hundred, two hundred million dollar world how many moving parts, how many things. Mm. Because even that at that world, they're still financing these things. They're still there's still banks, they're still like you gotta get Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's not like Disney's just writing checks, though they probably can at this point, but they're smart enough not to use their own money. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's insane. Well, you know, our, our big thing too is look, I mean, we've got we've got projects in the pipeline for the next year or two years that, that are those studio level films. But for right now, where the world's at, where we're at, we control the clock, you know, and we're able to really we're we're able to work with ADs and work with line producers and work with directors that we can talk to every day. And and you know, we can control the financing and the model and control the sales and control the marketing, you know, to a degree. Right. But we're able to control the clock a little bit more, which is, which has been helpful and it, it keeps us busy, mm-hmm. but it allows us to, to sort of work with and to spit out a product that, you know, we know sort of shares the integrity that we went into it with. Can you guys talk a little bit about the importance of a bankable star based off of budget so you know because i always tell people like look if you got a fifty thousand dollar movie anytime you could put a bankable star in even if it's a face do it anytime at any budget range but as that budget continues to go up you at that point need to have bankable stars of certain magnitudes depending on the budget so certain actors can finance a million dollar a two million dollar, even a five million dollar, but they're not going to finance a thirty million. Then you need another two or three of those guys, or you need Bruce Willis to show up, uh, or you need, right, right. Or, you know. And Bruce does, I think, movie a, a week now. I think he's doing a movie a week at I this think point. Bruce, yeah, Bruce is a, a one day, one day shop. <laughs> he just just pops up. He's doing three hundred sixty five movies this year. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but filmmakers don't really get that a lot of times, and they're like, oh, I wanted to. Again, it goes into that hobby thing where like, oh, I want to be pure. I'm like, well, I want the best actor for the role. Then do it for 50 grand. Don't do it for 500 grand. So can you talk about the importance of it and then how you're able to attract these actors? I think we kind of touched upon this. Like money talks. So if you show up and drop some money, you're going to get people's attention pretty quickly. We, through the years, everybody's got a gatekeeper, right? And so the agents and the managers, they're gatekeepers. It's like any business, you you know, you sort of all come up together or you you meet here and there. Um, In my world, I I was in Venice Beach for a long time and it took a lot of the sort of the razor blades out out of the agents and out of the managers when we were having a beer at Hinata or the Whaler or, you know, at the beach. So forging those relationships, you know, it's a Q and A, you know, we're on the producing side. They're on the, they're on the deal side. So we've been able to over the course of a few years, balance each other, say, Hey, let me, you know, pick your brain on this. Let me pick your brain on that. So that access to talent or that access to a quick read has been very beneficial. And and that's a relationship thing. And I I hate that term, but but it is relevant like any business. Um, I think that, you know, money talks, that's how you get your talent. Uh, you got to get to the talent. So how do you get through the gatekeeper? A good story, some level of packaging, and an offer that you can come in with. Now, once that talent is there, what we really focus on is, is having a good experience. You know, we want our talent to feel as though they're valued on set. They're not just a hired piece, you know, and it, it, so far that's been pretty successful. Those conversations go beyond the film. They, they turn into text messages. Hey, are you watching this game? Or, hey, are you going to be in L.A. or Boulder or this or that? So it is. It, it's relationships. Um, and then, you know, we've been very fortunate to sort of repeat working with certain actors. And, and mm-hmm. you know, when you do that, like anything else, it's human nature. People say, well, these guys have got to be doing something right. <laughs> this guy's working with them a number of times. And they bring in their friends. And, and it's sort of a pyramid. Right it, it it is it is like kind of like who's dating the you know the hot girl, uh, and right. then like and then all the other girl all the other girls are like well if and this ugly dude obviously is I'm not that you guys are the ugly dudes but uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like this we are. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, like, look, I didn't know this was visual, so normally we, you know, we can look presentable. We can look presentable, all right? We can achieve no, but it when we need to. But it's it's always kind of like, but it's, it goes with investors too. It's like, who's the first one to the party? And then when you, you have, a, a, you know, a hot girl or a hot guy at the party all the time, everybody else, all the other guys and gals are going, wait a minute, why is that movie star hanging out with these guys constantly? Um, yeah. and then like, then you start investigating it and they're like, Oh, well this, and I have to ask you though, you know, once you build relationships with actors, which I've had the pleasure of being able to build relationships with actors over the years, I call them up sometimes directly. I'll go, Hey man, I got a project you want in. We've already now it's a, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship that we've built over years. And I go, I don't want to cut out the agent because you don't want to piss off the agent. So can you talk a little bit about the political minefield that is calling up the actor directly or maybe talking to the actor first and then going to the, the agent? How do you guys, you know, straddle that? Well, we do exactly that. So, I mean, we'll, we, we definitely play by the protocols um, of, of how to conduct it because the reality is even if you have that relationship, you can have that conversation you do need then to engage the team because there's a lot of moving parts behind, you know, and certainly in the caliber of the actor or actress, it, that, you know, that team is obviously larger or smaller. There's a lot of moving parts in there. And, and you could probably have a creative conversation with talent for a little while, but in order for it to become real, right. it, has to, it has to go through the proper channels. And I feel as though there's a lot of cases where there is maybe that one-on-one -on -one relationship and, uh, and they'll talk about something for, a very, like for an extended period of time. And because they haven't started engaging the right parties, it never really gets there because things are being built behind all of these talent like all the time. I mean, things are being evaluated for them to be in, star in. Uh, their schedule is filling up. I mean, sometimes their schedule is filling up Almost without their them being aware of it. I mean, really. I mean, I mean, they have to. They have to. They have to okay everything. But my point is, it's like there is a machine behind them that is uh, that is handling what they are attached to, what they get engaged on. So, so we typically, and and I don't want to speak for both Rob, like for both of us, but we typically will have that conversation. But then we, then we go immediately to their team, uh, so that. So that everything there's just clarity and everything is just transparent right from the start. Otherwise, it's like almost getting the reset button. You know, you get engaged, have this long conversation with talent, and then you hit up the team, and it's like you might as well just hit reset because right. it starts all over again. So, well, well, yeah, I mean, let's not pretend that there aren't egos that go top to bottom. What? Wait, 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 wait a minute. There's egos in this business? No. <laughs> no. Stop it. So, so the, the funny part is, is there, and I hope agents and managers aren't listening, but, you know, a lot of times there might be bigger egos on that side of the aisle than, than the talent. And so I think that if you're not sort of appreciating and respecting every lane of the business, sure, sure. then there's a lot of butt hurt people and, and they will literally stall what could be a pretty easy transaction. You know, they get paid, the actor gets paid, we get our actor you know, and so, it, you know, what we try to do is even if there's that personal relationship, we're very quick to stay in our own lane. Hey, you know, actress X or actress or actor Y, you know, we would love you for this project. We're going to have our attorney reach out to your representation and have this go the right way. We present offers through the appropriate channels. We really try to lean on our legal while we can just sort of create some buffer between what could be a relationship, whether it be an agent or an actor and the actual business. I mean, we all, I, I like to think we all have the same goal in mind. Uh, and 99% of the time that's the case, but to Jay's point, I mean, we really are adamant about just doing things the right way. And we're the type of people that'll go the extra mile and do the extra work. And if that means, you know, one extra step to make sure that that last person was on that email or, got notified that, hey, this is going to come through. We just wanted to do it this way. Well, then everybody's on the same page. And then that, that actor or actress's team, then they can determine how to sort of circulate around something. And, and we're very hands-on from that point. I I, uh, I I can't tell you how refreshing this whole conversation has been so far. Uh, it I can't – It's it, for people listening, it, this doesn't happen. But what you guys are saying is what should be the industry norm, but is not. 
There's so many different kind of players out there who don't do the basics. This is not like revolutionary stuff you guys are talking about here. This, right. well, that's this not is rocket science. It's, it's not rocket science. science, guys. It is it is base like basic thing. Like if you want to make coffee, you need a coffee bean. Like it's a simple, real basic stuff. Yeah. But most people are like, I'm gonna make coffee, but out of mud. I'm like, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I'm gonna and then I'm gonna tell you it's it's the, the best coffee bean in the world. And I have a letter of intent yeah. from the best coffee bean in the world. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> So it's remar- it's remarkable. Now, uh, another thing that I find fascinating about you guys is you guys are a production company. So, but you do have deep wells in the investment world, meaning that you you finance your own projects essentially. How do you or do you have any advice on pitching investors uh, on your projects and how you kind of package them to a certain extent for for filmmakers? Because that is obviously everybody wants to know. Like you said at the beginning of this conversation. It's all about how we're going to get the finances to make our art and and hopefully make some money doing it. Well, I think that sort of circles back to your your original or one of the questions that you made, Alex, which was um, if young if filmmakers are trying to put something together and they're going around to to either look for a co production partner or something along those lines. Uh, one, it's you know vetting things properly, uh, and and two, making sure that you do have a model. Uh, behind you um, but I mean for for investors it's recognizing that it's a business that you are you're selling something so you know one of the things that Rob and I the conversations that Rob and I have had with uh, with people when when we maybe don't see eye to eye they brought us something and we're looking at building it out with them because we actually really do like the IP and everything and don't worry this is circling back to financing and, and money but you know looking at building it out is and if there's some pushback, we'll look at them and say, I mean, tell me about another business that can operate that way. Like, so <laughs> take yourself out of the film business and say, right. what other business on earth could ever operate that way? Right. Where people would, where people would be like, let me in, you know, uh, let me, <laughs> let me give you my hard earned money, right. That I've been working for years for. And I don't even care if you've inherited it. It's still, it was Somebody, somebody worked for it. Right. Somebody worked for it. So this hard earned money and put it into this. Right. I mean, so that that's like the first thing you have to think about when you're approaching anyone is wait a second, like you you de- take yourself out of the arts. If you're trying to if you're trying to get people to give you a lot of money for an art, take remove yourself from it and recognize how would this operate in any other format. Right? And if if you can see that, then that's great. But that's like that's one of the first things that Rob and I will say to someone. How, how would that ever work? So then outside of that, it's, it's like any business. You are trying to mitigate risk, okay? Right. And one of, the, one of the first things that anyone is going to talk about with regards to film, um, or, or I'm sorry, or any, any, any form of media for that matter, is it's a risky investment. It's, it's a risky business um, because what you're selling is you're selling a product, but – but you're also you're relying on people to like it, not that they need it. And especially right now, where there's endless content available to everyone. Now it's not so much like, oh, you know, well, I need it. I need something to watch in the evenings, right? I mean, the kids have gone to bed finally, and now, you know, I can sit down and watch something and escape for a little period of time before, you know, the morning comes and everything starts again. That that well is massive. So now it's got to, it, it actually has to be, it can't just be the content. That's not what you're selling anymore. You're actually selling something that people actually have to like and want. So, so I mean, that's, that's the, whenever we talk about finance and bringing in money, we won, we, we have a model so that we can show, look, we've evaluated the market. We recognize that the budget is going to speak to the market right now in this genre. Um, our talent, uh, this comes back to where you asked about, you know, or made a comment about uh, finding that A-lister or that star that is going to drive sales or be your most marketable piece in the film. You know, you have to actually, you have to pay very close attention to that because not every actor speaks to every genre. And that'll be something that a lot of people will present to us. They'll say, oh, we think this person is perfect and, you know, and they sell so well. And we'll be like, well, no. They sell so well, but not in that genre. They have, they, there's there's no knowledge to them in that. So yes, they're a known name, 
but then you do have to actually, it has to be, you know, well researched as to whether they are going to inform sales speak to that. So all of that is, is basically just trying to find ways to mitigate the risk of investment on every project. And it is, so, and, and it is when you're, when you're hiring an actor, a name actor, you're basically paying for marketing up front is you are investing in a marketing budget up front. So if you're getting if you're paying for Thomas Jane, he has a built-in audience and a built-in built-in awareness that he's been able to build up over his career that has value. When you do that for Bruce Willis, that's telling investors and that's telling people who are buying your film and and buyers, you've in, you've pre-invested in marketing. Where in a world where you know, films of your size, um you you can't compete with the studios there's just no way you can compete marketing money there's just you can't you can't market your yeah, film we're anymore. not we're not matching we're not matching our budget in marketing in vr no no or and doubling VR it right or tripling now. yeah it, exactly and even if you did what what would that be, what value would that bring like seriously like how could you would you even make a dent in the universe of, of some sort of awareness but you put bruce willis in your movie there's automatic awareness, there's automatic. You know, so when you're scanning through a thousand things, you're like, oh, there's Bruce, or there's Thomas, or, or you know, or there, and that's what you're paying for when you hire these these named actors, and that's what filmmakers need to truly understand. And also another thing I always try to say is some actors, we were kind of joking about Bruce. Bruce is still Bruce, and Nicolas Cage is still Nicolas Cage, no question. Um, but there were certain actors who oversaturated the market with themselves, and I worked on movies where they're like, Oh, this poor guy like paid a good amount of money for this one actor, but he did 25 movies that year. I'm not exaggerating. Right. And he went out to the distribution companies like, we already got three of those guys, of that guy this year. We're good. And he got, yeah. he got saddled with a movie that he couldn't sell because the actor was oversaturated. So there's, you've got to kind of figure that out as well. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely tightrope we work, we walk. Well, you know, and that's why, <laughs> that's why we do pay close attention and speak pretty regularly with our sales guys and say, you know, what's in the pipeline for this individual? You know, what do we need to be aware of? Not today, but six months from now. Right. Uh, I, you know, I want to add one more thing to the financing. So two things, really. I, I think the most important thing for people to take away is you have to be flexible and you have to adapt. That adapt to the money and you have to adapt creatively because they're, they're intertwined no matter what. So one of the ways that we really kickstart a lot of projects, we have skin in the game. Hmm. We'll put skin in the game as a company so we can give an investment group, an investor, another company for a co-pro some level of confidence that that we're in it. You know, we've got something to lose, too. We're working. Money doesn't like being alone. It, yeah, no, yeah. Money doesn't like sitting alone. alone. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> misery. Misery loves company. <laughs> exactly. And it's also infectious. Oh, you know, my neighbor might want to Yeah, in. absolutely. Um, the other thing I was going to say in, in sort of – as we're looking at financial models and as we're looking at sales and how do we maximize something being marketable, right. we have not not changed the the gender of an actor or an actress in a film. I mean, we have mm -hmm. flipped roles because we've identified, oh, well, you know, that actor might be more, more, might be better as an actress because we can get this individual in that might increase the marketability so long as it doesn't take away from the creative. And, you know, Jay and I are very, uh, not pushy, but very upfront with our filmmakers to say, look, any suggestion we have, we're in your corner as a director, we're in your corner as a creative team, we are always going to be pushing for what makes this movie the most marketable, most commercial it can be. Because aside from the money, that means more eyeballs are going to see it. So if there are ways for us to make improvements like that, that's how it all connects. The marketability, the commercialability, the sales, the money, the investors get their money back. They come back to us and say, what do you have next? And the actors are happy. <laughs> so it's, it's a win, 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 win across everybody, across everybody's. Exactly. And that's, uh, again, another rarity in our business, <laughs> yeah. to, to say the least. Now, one, one thing, um, most most filmmakers have this problem. And I think everybody at any stage in the, in the game, other than in the studio system, is distribution. Is actually making money with their products because you know, before the, you know, it, it was the cost to make the product was such a difficult thing and expensive thing. Now you can make a pretty high quality product with the right people uh, at a low cost. 
but getting it out into the marketplace and actually generating revenue with that um, is more difficult now than ever before in the ever-changing landscape where TVOD used to be a thing, now is no longer a thing, really, especially in the independent film market. SVOD is great, but they don't pay you for three years. So how, yeah. well, how, do, you, how do you make that business work? You know, AVOD is great, but you know, so, and then foreign sales is not what it was in the 90s or the early 2000s, and you, you don't have DVD to fall back on anymore. So how do you guys you know, generate revenue with your films. Like, how is it, like, how are you, are you doing sales agents? Are you doing pre-sales foreign? What, where is that kind of work? I mean, obviously don't give me numbers that I don't want your entire business model, guys, but just generally. No, absolutely. I mean, look, it's, we honestly, it's, it's different with every film. So mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a fact. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of filmmakers right now that are a massive part of their finance model is foreign sales. So sure. they'll, they'll lock in a certain amount of foreign sales and then they'll maybe try and leave domestic open, but more often than not, they'll, you know, make a big domestic deal too. And then they'll evaluate what that shortfall or that gap could look like. And is this, is this pre, is this pre-production or is this after production? Pre-production. Pre so you're pre-selling, pre you're pre-selling based yeah, on pre-selling, on... pre-selling to foreign. Um, and then even looking and then looking at an MG domestically, uh, and then evaluating what a gap or a shortfall could look like. Okay. Now, that so that so that 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 that's why that's when you have to pay very very close attention to the film. So you know to how it's how that genre has been performing over the past couple of years, um, how your talent within the in the film have been performing, or who you're looking at signing into the film uh, have been performing over the past couple of years, because if you have sort of pre-sold the film to all the major markets. And now you're, you, you are recognizing that you still have a gap or a shortfall and you're filling that with potential equity um, instead of, or maybe looking at your senior financing and thinking a bridge or something along those lines. The problem is that where that is where you can find yourself in a spot where you're turning to someone, you're saying, well, this is what's left. And you know, we need this as a, as a shortfall. Do you want it as equity? You want to make an equity investment? Where are you pointing to the potential ROI? For that money for the right. person that's coming in because you've pretty much sold the film everywhere where it's going to perform well and if if you were so in need of the money to make the film to green light the film that you weren't able to evaluate the best deal either from a domestic sale or in foreign um you weren't really looking at the windows you know or like well, when it was going to be available so you're all of a sudden you're sitting in a spot where, sure, you've got a complete model if they fill the gap, but how are you? How are you explaining to them where they're going to see revenue? Yeah. Right, because things are going to get eaten by the foreign distributors, and then the sales agent's going to take their fee, and then mm -hmm. it comes back in, and then if you were working with senior financier to cover all of that, then they've got their fee, and then that's coming out, and and then all of a sudden, there's all these things that are getting paid out ahead of this gap. Or shortfall and the gap or shortfall doesn't even have any collateralized territories or profitable territories to sit on so so that's something you have to be very you know conscious of when you're when you are examining that sort of pre-sale model uh which we do uh and then if uh you know if you if you have a strong enough relationship with with sales and distributors and you can engage in these conversations and not have to perhaps you know sell your film right up front, mm -hmm. but, but have those conversations, recognize what it's worth is. Um, again, that's a lot of that is relationship based, but it's also having worked with them in the past and sure. delivered. Right. So, so there's, there's that. And then, then when you're speaking to, to someone from an equity standpoint, hard money, as opposed to soft money, you can say, look, we've deliberately left this, 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 and this open. And let me show you, how this genre and this talent has performed and not not five years ago now. yeah so you know no blair witch projections uh no <laughs> no paranormal activity projections as a horror movie in your sales pitch no like it's no, they, they made a billion yeah. dollars you could too oh uh, yeah there's a lot <laughs> yeah, Alex, that's one of those other ones when they show you the comps and they're from 2003 and you go oh uh, no, i don't blair, know about dude this. blair witch is still on every low budget horror movie uh, comp ever <laughs> we, we see insidious 
and yep. uh, Blair Witch. Paranormal. Pa- and paranormal. Don't forget paranormal. Yeah. <laughs> but see, that's but that's also so that's 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 the other you know that's you know where that's what brings up a very important subject. We we deal a lot with sort of savvy investors, right? So that have already been in the game, so they expect a certain thing from our model. Um, they know that if they're going to get engaged, uh, if they're evaluating it from a from hard money standpoint, that that. We have, we have, we can answer to their ROI. We can answer to their immediate ROI, and and we even have room in the waterfall, right? I mean, because you know, mm-hmm. people love talking about the waterfall, but you know, right. there's so many cases where the gap in shortfall, it would take so long for them to even get their ROI, their initial ROI on their investment. Oh. Forget about the back end points. <laughs> I mean, my God, wow. Well, it's kind of like a, it's, it's kind of like a river. And, and it's going over into a waterfall, and at, at first, it's wide open, and the waterfall is plentiful, and there's a lot of water running through. <laughs> but every time you throw some new financing, there's another log. There's another <laughs> there's another giant rock, and then all of a sudden, that waterfall starts slowing down to the point where it's a trick. By the time it gets to the edge, yeah. it's, a, it's a trickle. But you sold, them, you sold them the open waterfall, and that's the problem. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I can't tell you how many times we've been distracted at earlier stages. I mean, Jay and I are big you know, contract guys, right? Mm-hmm. So everybody knows what's going on. Sure. Everybody involved. You put it in the drawer after you sign it. Hopefully you never look at it again, but there's no lingering, well, what about this? What about that kind of right. conversation? <laughs> right. I cannot tell you how many, how many projects have been stalled by producers or other individuals fighting for back end points. And you just want to say, you got to make the damn movie first. <laughs> and then, oh, and yeah. then, you know, oh. then maybe we'll see something. <laughs> but that, that's a that's a term that I always sort of get turned off by. Oh, everybody. I mean, how many times? I mean, I've had. I mean, when I was first starting out, we were me and my original producing partner. When I was just starting off off a short film, I was producing that was getting a lot of heat around town, and I, we were taking meetings. We were fighting about the feature rights. We're like, I want this credit, and I want that credit, and I want this back end point. I'm like. And, uh, you know, only time kind of shows you, like, you're idiots. Yeah. There's, this is not Spider-Man, guys. You need to calm the hell down. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, it's not. You want to fight for those points, absolutely right. fight away. But there's no potential. Let's make the damn thing first, and then let's talk right. about talk about what's kind of in music. It's the same thing. <laughs> Who's got the publishing absolutely. rights? <laughs> Who doesn't have the publishing rights? Same thing. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and I think that's the thing when you were saying, sort of saying people using the Blair Witch – on you know on a deck to to help sell their film or to help or to help work on investment for investors to, you know drop some hard equity into it it's uh i mean that can work for for investors that have no experience in the business dentist so they dentist that and they think, wow that's sexy i mean yeah I, I can't get an roi like that on any other investment yeah, but it's so but it's immoral it's immoral you can't well, you can't throw an anomaly Blair Witch was an yeah. anomaly. Par- paranormal yeah. activity was an anomaly. And and there's no was longevity anomaly. to that. Right. There's no longevity. So you'll make one movie. And Rob and I have had this conversation a million times. We have no interest in making one movie. Right. I mean, right. That's so if you if you deceive right. essentially, that's pretty much what it is. If you yeah. deceive of course. investors or you deceive partners that are coming in on your project, mm-hmm. they're never coming back. And anyone Burn. they know is never coming back. So you, you haven't forged a relationship that's now going to come back on your next two or three films. It's toxic. They're You've to- you, yeah, toxic. Yeah. You're starting from scratch all over again on your next film. So you, well, you, you put so much work into building that out for it to go nowhere. And that, and that, and and again, on top of that, you're not even starting from scratch. You're starting worse than scratch because now you've got a bad reputation out there, well, and now you've got to fight against that. Huh? When you move, Alex. That's when you move. You, that's when you move from Louisiana to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta yeah, to yeah. New Mexico, and New Mexico to Vancouver. <laughs> well, it's crazy because yeah. it's such a it's such a big big business, and it's expanding across the world. But it's a it's small, small business. So if you piss one person off, that travels. Dude, you have no idea. Like I'm sure if you and I started, if you guys and I started like talking off air about who we know, I promise yeah. you, we know pe- the same people. And yeah. I and I've talked to so many people on the show, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I worked with that guy, or that guy. I, I started with them when they were coming up, or oh this guy or that guy, or this this gal." And it's 
it's people think it's a big business. It is not. Everybody knows well, everybody. Very small world. It's very small, and I, I, it never ceases to amaze me how small of a world it really is in our business. And if you piss somebody off or you do somebody wrong, it will come back to you. There's no Always. question. Oh, yeah. No question about it. And the best advice I ever got uh, <laughs> for being in the film business, and everyone listening knows this because I say it at nauseum, uh, don't be a dick. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that goes from the grip to the right. PA all the way to Are the producers kidding? and the director. Absolutely. Because yeah. you don't want to work with it, you don't want to work with a dick all day. Well, no. you know, I almost find it takes more energy to be a dick <laughs> than it is to just either be nice or walk away. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's for you because other people have made it into an art form of being a dick. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you run into I'm Have you run into that guy? I've run into that guy. He must, there's only one. There's only the one guy in, in Hollywood uh, who, who's a dick. Everyone else is super cool, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, yeah. so what are you guys up to next? What are your next projects? So we're out in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico right now doing a film called Squealer uh, with Andy Armstrong of the Armstrong family. Huge stunt coordinating family. Andy is behind the camera right now. Big second unit director. So our, our idea behind that was let's take a sort of a horror, thriller, action-y film and punch the hell out of it and really pump up the stunts make it look like something people haven't seen before. We've got Wes Chatham, uh, Theo Rossi, Catherine Monig. Our cast is growing. We're attaching two more today. Uh, we're thrilled about that. Um, we dropped a, a pretty good nugget the other day in Variety. We've acquired the rights to uh, famed adventurer John Fairfax, who, mm -hmm. if you haven't been familiar with who this man is, the most interesting man in the world commercials were based off of him. Wow. Uh, so we're we're very excited. Rode the ocean twice, single oar. This guy is wild. Single oar? Single oar? Really? Yeah. yeah. So, Jesus. I mean, I would advise anybody to go to his obituary, New York Times, John Fairfax, 2012. Your mind will be blown. So, so you mean to tell me that sharks him. have a week dedicated to him, is what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> there might be something in the works there. Uh, but uh, but no, we're uh, we're looking at a couple of big properties. We just uh, we just optioned something with Thomas Jane. We're going to co-pro uh, his next movie, a western, uh, late spring, uh, and a number of things in the works. I mean, we've we've been very comfortable um, and excited and happy living where we've been living right now. Uh, and I think twenty two and twenty three are going to see us take a take a leap uh, leap forward with some some sort of higher caliber, higher scale projects. Nice. Uh, that really, instead of doing this four to four to seven movies a year, probably get it down to about three or four. Three or four bigger, bigger ones as opposed to four to seven. Bigger pictures. Yeah, yeah. but that's but man, man, making four to seven super fun. Uh. <laughs> and, and look, that's, that's from a that's from a producing standpoint. I mean, we're always, you know, if we're EPing a project, that's fine. If there's sure. something that makes sense for us and we can be of use, we're always looking and we're always happy to help friends or find new projects. But from a real hands on producing standpoint i think we're really looking to to uh elevate the scale of what we're doing a bit and we've got some good property to do it with now i'm going to ask you guys a few, a few questions to ask all of my guests what advice would you give to a filmmaker trying to break into the business today well i i'll answer <laughs> go ahead Rob. Jay, jay's literally yeah, pissing I, himself right now jay is literally pissing yeah, himself yeah, right yeah. now i'll answer real quick so my assistant, Alyssa, who is a huge fan of this podcast. Oh, is she? Uh, oh, that's awesome. She is. She was a PA. And uh, on our last production, I said, you know, I, I just, my hands are too full to the production office. Do you guys have anybody that can help me out a little bit? Well, I'll tell you, she and her boyfriend have been the hardest workers on set as PAs. And what they ended up doing on our last film was Alyssa was working with me on her third film. She's now flying out here to work with us. Her boyfriend ended up driving talent around, ended up working in different departments. So my advice, and Jay, then you can chip in, is get yep. in. Get in there and PA. Because if you are with an eye shot of somebody, you're with an ear shot. And you're with an arm's length. And they're going to pull you in. And they're going to give you an opportunity to say, come help me out. And eventually that conversation turns into, oh, what do you want to do? Oh, you want to be in the camera department. Well, let me see if I can get you to be a camera PA. Something along those lines. My big thing is start at the bottom. You know, you don't have to have a script. You don't have to try to be a filmmaker to be a filmmaker. I, I would really 
urge, you know, try to get in on the ground and do as much as you can on set or in an office working with the people that are doing it. Yeah. I mean, so just to touch on and and carry off of what Rob said, the, yeah, I mean, really get engaged, get really engaged because understanding all the roles is so valuable. I mean, even if you're a, even if you're a screenwriter, an aspiring director, um, anything, understanding everyone's job that's required in order to produce these things, to deliver these things, because it's a lot of moving pieces. And if you're ignorant to any of those moving pieces, it's going to affect your ability to, to, to properly present yourself or your material. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, get in there, get different jobs, you know, even if it's not something that you want to do, learn it so that when you do actually get that door open to, to the, to the field that you love, you can actually speak intelligently, but what you need from different departments, different key heads, everything else. Um, and then I would say outside of that, don't be precious. Just don't be precious over your material, right? I mean, God, the number of people that are sitting on potential IP and they're like this, well, I just, it, this isn't the right, this isn't the right outfit, or, you know, this is, I, I'm worried that they're going to do this with it, or if I show it now, it's not going to work out, and, and then I'm going to, you know, and then it's going to be gone, so just don't, because the truth is, you will do that forever, and then, then that material that you thought was just so valuable, it's not relevant, or or you've given everyone so much time to either touch on a small piece of it, right? Because, you know, so many of our ideas and, you know, so many of our creative ideas that we come up with, they're, they're triggered from something we've read, something we've seen, something we've experienced. And to think that there aren't a vast number of people that are experiencing the same thing and might have similar ideas or anything else. So get it out there. You see an opportunity, don't hold it close to your chest. You know, be smart, be smart, right? I mean, mm-hmm. talk to Protect legal, it. get sure, their sure. sign, be smart, but don't be precious. Yeah, and I, I always tell people, the business is tough enough, man. You don't need to throw more obstacles in front of you. There's going to be plenty of them along, along the way without you screwing yourself up. Just, you know, don't, as 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 a, a famous sage once said, don't don't push the river. Don't, it's yeah. not, don't push, it's going to flow. <laughs> and you know what, the best thing too is you said about, about, you know, don't be a dick. Honestly, our business is stressful enough. Oh God! That, I mean, be around dicks. I mean, come on. Oh. And we all have been. We all had been when we we're coming up. We all have Absolutely. to deal. We all have to deal with either bosses or, or egomaniacs or you know or sociopaths. <laughs> I dealt with a mobster for a while. That's a whole other story. Oh, uh, that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll tell you a quick story, real quick, and then I don't want to press time. But you know, I was a PA before, and. and we're talking about Bruce Willis and, you know, he was, he was due to come into the office and I was working for a, a very well-known producer at the time mm-hmm. and he was neurotic. And I was like, why are you neurotic? He goes, well, well, Bruce really likes a clean office, which understandably. And I'm looking around and I'm like, well, David, this place is spotless. And he gets on his hands and knees and he gets under a desk and he pulls out a piece of trash. And I go, David, I'll get it. I'll get it. I'm the assistant. Right. And he goes, doesn't matter. We're on the same team. I'm going to get reamed out by him. He doesn't know who you are. doesn't care who you are. And he goes, I'll just do it myself. I'm right here. That little lesson taught me so much yeah, man. to just go ahead and do it. We're all in the same team. I don't have to have any level of hierarchy. Hey, you go do this. It's got to get done. And I think if you can lead by example, uh, it, it, it travels down all the way down the line. I, and, I... and for some reason, for somebody that's coming up, you know, impressions matter. And if you if you listen and if you're if you're astute and you're a go-getter and you don't have to talk to necessarily, you know, just absorb everything and, and be in the room. And I think that that could really go a long way for a lot of people. And I mean, I just saw a, a video of Keanu Reeves on John Wick 4 carrying camera gear up a stair upstairs. Yeah. yeah, on on a company move, and everyone was like, "Look at Keanu Reeves! Oh my God, he is literally, you know, a saint." 
And I'm like, he's yeah. a human being, man. He's a he's a right. good he's just a good dude, man. I mean, he's like he's just a good dude. That's all it is. Like he's not like he's not Jesus, guys. You know, but he's right. he's a good dude, and I'd love to work with him one day, as I'm sure everybody yeah. would. <laughs> so, Keanu, if you're listening, any three yeah. of us, any of us would love to work with you, sir. We'll we'll make it work for you. We'll make it work for you. Um, now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Yeah. So, so, you know, mine is it's, it applies to both. I have two young daughters. Um, it, the lesson for me has been to know when to turn it off. So I, I've <laughs> always just been a hustler my whole life. And I mm-hmm. always thought, okay, I have to do all of these things. If, it, if it's ever going to happen, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, part of it's a function of being where we are career wise. It makes it a little easier, but you know, uh, especially through the pandemic, I was much more able to just press pause on everything, have lunch with my kids. And I think that that has translated into work as well, where I don't feel like I need to answer every email within five seconds. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, there's a, uh, there's sort of this like hurry up and wait mentality in Hollywood, but there's this panic if I don't do it now. So I think the lesson learned for me is that it's okay to sort of take a beat, you know, it's, it's certainly been reflective in my work as well, because I'm, I'm more, you know, aware of what I'm putting out there and I'm more conscientious of let's, n- let's just not push, 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 but let's actually take a second and sit back, A, take care of yourself for a moment, enjoy what's around you and B, you know, take some time to make sure that what you're doing, you're doing right. But is that, but that also is, is age. I mean, your yeah. twenty-one-year-olds are not generally coming to that enlightened state. Right. Uh, right. It, it, yeah. You know, and it took me a while too, man. I've been hustling, as you can see, still hustling with <laughs> every, everywhere, nonstop. Yeah. To a certain point, my wife actually said, "You, you don't, you don't need to garage sale anymore. We don't need you to go hustle out, you know, this or that." Um, yeah. I, I got a real quick story I got to tell you because it's so funny, and I think it really hits this point. Uh, years ago when we moved to LA for the first time, I, I was, uh, during Christmas, I always figured out how to hustle things. So I figured out that on GameStop, there was this video game that you could buy on sale for like $15, but on Amazon, it was on sale for $50. So I was like, Oh wow, this is cool. So most people are like, oh, you must have bought like a whole bunch of things from GameStop. I'm like, no, that's way too much work. So what I did is I posted it on Amazon for 60. Anytime a sale would come in, I would then have buy it off of GameStop, put their address in and have GameStop ship it directly to them. So I was basically doing um, arbitrage uh, <laughs> with, and I pulled in like, oh, before GameStop stopped it, I had like 40 or 50 sales in before GameStop's like, what the hell's going on with this account? And I was so proud. And I went to my wife. I'm like, look how much money we made for Christmas. This is great. She's like, we didn't move across the effing country for you to sell video games. We're here for you to be a filmmaker. And I was like, oh, shh. And it's just like that moment, you just have to go, okay, I need to pull back for a second really yeah. what's important and why am i here what am i doing as opposed to the i gotta make money i gotta make money or i gotta hustle i gotta hustle i gotta hustle jay what's your yeah. what's your answer to that uh well then so yeah if we're looking at you know without the uh, years and age sort of coming into play uh and young i would say um not to wait for tomorrow like where it's going to be a little bit more perfected Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and so, and Rob was just sort of touching in it. Like I've got two little girls too. And I same here. Yeah. Same amazing, here. Amazing. We're all in good company. Well, so. twin girls, twin girls, man. It's uh, I'm 25. Oh. Look what they've done to me. I'm 25 years old. Look what they've done to me. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's the thing, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you basically, it's, it's uh, you don't, cause there is that, especially in this business. And again, it sort of touched on that where, where I was sort of saying to people not be precious it's um it's waiting like you know <laughs> oh it'll be i'll have this other piece added to it by tomorrow or or this will be finessed a little bit more by tomorrow and then that tomorrow becomes the tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and and yeah i mean and then it's just it ends up being wasted time so i would say i would say that that's something that took me a while to learn at the beginning um especially as a writer at that time uh it's uh 
it's you know yeah don't wait the art of good the art of good enough yeah the art of good enough because if not you'll be five years on one script Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and and last question: three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> oh boy, Jay, do you want to jump in there? Not really. Well, I mean, not really, no. <laughs> of all time. Uh, I mean, uh, look. I mean, there's got you got to put in Weekend at Bernie's. I mean, oh, well, ob- I mean, obviously, <laughs> obviously, obviously, Weekend at Bernie's has to be in there. Um, oh man. David, who's the, who's the, oh god, I forgot the director's name. Rob, dude, 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 man. Whatever I, you say is gonna sound better than mine. I don't know. We can you, you hit one. Hit one. We'll go. We'll bounce back and forth. Okay, so I'll I'll give you my three, but one of them has an A attached to it. So in no particular order, we've got Rudy, we've got Tommy Boy, <laughs> we've got we've got Love Actually. Wow. <laughs> So that pretty much told me everything I need to know about you, sir. Uh, it's, yeah. I pretty much got your entire personality yeah. wrapped in those three films. <laughs> and I'll give you, I'll give you my three A and <laughs> National Treasure. Oh, oh my God, dude! I, uh, listen, I uh, told you I'm in this game because right, what's entertaining to me is <laughs> entertainment's entertainment. I swear to God, if National can... Treasure is on, I am not moving, and I can recite every line. I am. Um, I, I think. I think you and I can have a beer, sir. Uh, those three. Yeah. Uh, those. Those that's three. A good combination. That's a hell of a. Yeah. That's a hell of a combo, man. Love we'll actually cry, throwing it. We'll laugh. We'll be on the edge of our seats. Tommy team. boy, yeah. Rudy. I mean, think of it. It's so true, though. If you if you actually back up and just evaluate your favorite films by the films that you've watched a thousand times, an incredible yeah. number of times, yeah. and if it's on, you don't turn off, and you actually don't even start multitasking, but watching. Love actually. I mean. That happened, what, for the, like, I can't even imagine, the hundredth time over the holidays this year? Yeah. I mean, you turn, you, literally you just keep all watching. of a sudden, it you came know. on, because it's always on, the holidays, and all of us, <laughs> that, <laughs> didn't go anywhere, and watch it. It's, 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 you know, we all could say Citizen Kane. We could all say Godfather, but I haven't watched Citizen Kane since film school. And I and Godfather is not a movie I watch every weekend. Uh, you know, it's and don't get me wrong, Godfather is an amazing film, but it's those movies that you just watch again and again. You know, for me, Shawshank, Fight Club, The Matrix. That solid, all great. Solid, solid three. Like they turn on, and, you could th- and then you want to get into the eighties actions, Lethal Weapon, Predator. Die hard, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then we, now we could just yeah. see. This is what you this, see. This is what I. This is why I can't do this. And this is what it is every time. <laughs> I start saying that I'm like this. Oh, but wait a second. Oh, but this one too. Like this. Oh yeah. Then it's these three. Yeah. Then it's I mean, these three. You know. Yeah, it's so, it, I mean, it, it, it is. I always <laughs> like throwing that out there. It's like it's three that come to mind at this moment in time. It will change tomorrow. It will change five minutes from now. But at this moment in time. That's it. Boys, it has been an absolute joy talking to you guys. I wish you guys nothing but continued success in what you're doing. And uh, I appreciate you guys uh, coming on and sharing some tr- real you know, knowledge bombs with, uh, with my audience because it, 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 they need to hear it. They need to hear from people who are doing it and doing it right. So I do appreciate you guys coming on, man, and con- much continued success to you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's an honor for us. And uh, we're fans of the podcast and, you know, We're looking forward to making more movies.